This is the BBC. Hello and welcome. It's another download from your friends at BBC Radio 2. It's another Confessions podcast where we are surrounded by jingles like this. 88 91 FM. Hi, it's Radio 2 here. BBC Radio 2. Just to prove who we are. So the Confessions podcast this week has these tales all lined up and ready to go. Hold me, thrill me, kiss me, bill me, uh, which is a good one. Devil's haircut, I like that. Hit me with your hockey stick. And I don't like cricket. Anyway, here they all come. Father Simon and the venerable overseers of confessional justice. I write to you in the hope that I will be absolved of the weight that I have carried upon my shoulders for almost 40 years. <laughs> my tale begins in the late 70s, when I was a naive nine-year-old at my local infant school. In between playing jacks or double ball, pretending to be the blonde one from ABBA and other such <laughs> playground favourites, the subject of boys had started cropping up in the girls' conversations at playtime. It appeared that the fancy of most of the girls had been taken by one particular young man who, due to his penchant for causing mischief and sometimes menace wherever he went, we shall call Dennis. Dennis had an unruly shock of unkempt hair and was therefore not easy to miss. Thus, his escapades rarely went unnoticed or unpunished by the staff, and his exploits were the subject of many a revered tale told in hushed tones throughout the school. The more mischief Dennis made, the more it seemed the girls were drawn to him. Dennis literally had a queue of girls waiting in line to be his girlfriend, myself included. Imagine my joy then when one day I was asked by one of his hench boys <laughs> <laughs> to meet with Dennis on the school playing field. Oh, yes. Mm. Under the cover... <laughs> Under the cover of his oversized green parker, <laughs> I was elated to receive a rather hurried peck on the cheek and instructions from Dennis on what was required of me should I wish to be his girlfriend. This requirement was a payment of one pound. <laughs> <laughs> yes! From me. Before, Dennis said, anything between us could be made official. Quite right. Wow. Yeah. A quid. <laughs> now, delighted at being the chosen one, and in no way curious as to why the one pound was needed, I assured him that I would obtain the money as soon as possible, <laughs> despite the fact that I had none. I had no pounds to my name. Aww. This is like a whole movie. The whole solution, the only solution I could see, was to borrow the cash from my mum's Freeman's catalogue money that she collected every week from her friends and neighbours, resolving to pay it back in the weeks after from my own pocket money. I knew the stash was in a cupboard out of my reach in the kitchen, and so I set out to undertake the task that I believed would procure me the object of my affections. Unaccustomed as I was to petty thievery, my plan to climb up and get the money when my mum was out of the kitchen predictably failed. I was caught bang to rights, and there ensued a very heated debate about what I thought I was doing with my hand in the catalogue jug. If that's even a phrase. Thinking quickly, I burst into tears and spewed forth the lurid tale of how Dennis, the naughty boy at school, was demanding money from me and how I hadn't told anyone for fear of what he and his horrid hench boys would do. My horrified mother believed every word and calls were made swiftly to his parents and his stash of illicit cash was duly found. After calls to the parents of my friends, it transpired that quite a number of them, plus Julie from 3B and Sarah from 4C, had also been made to give Dennis money. Well, I was in bits, says Minnie. I was caught between feeling bad about lying to my mum and the heartbreak of realising that my beloved had a queue of other girls he had promised his affections to, subject to a down payment. <laughs> <laughs> of course. It's like an episode of Grange Hill. All happening. Uh, once the next day at school in the headmaster's office, a group of very vexed schoolgirls stood as one, connected by the embarrassing need to never reveal that they had ever been duped into giving money to Dennis in return for his affections. All the girls gave their accounts of Dennis, menacingly demanding money from them, and collectively had him suspended from school for a week, all based on a version of events that I had concocted. 
Which is which was kind of true, but anyway. Looking back, I understand that requesting money from immature young girls, regardless of the reason, was a pretty low thing for a boy to do. And so for that reason, Father Simon, I do not seek forgiveness from Dennis. I also do not seek forgiveness from my so-called friends who were quite possibly denied the chance to be his girlfriend because not one of them had told me that they'd been sharing pecs under his parka too, <laughs> if you see what I'm saying. <laughs> Father Simon, to this day, my mother is still none the wiser about the real reason I pilfered money from the Freeman's catalogue jug, and so it is from her that I seek forgiveness, leading my mother to believe that I was the innocent victim of a menacing playground extortion racket rather than simply a love st- love-struck sucker is something I'm not proud of. Over the years, the urge to confess has played in my mind quite often, but has been suppressed by my belief that regardless of the reasons for stealing the money, I was ultimately one of the many naive victims who were stupidly coerced into giving money under false pretenses. Whether the esteemed collective and the listeners share this belief and consider that I should be forgiven, now rest in your hands. I notice there's been an interesting ending to that confession which has been removed. (laughs) Which is essentially what happened to Dennis later in his life. Anyway, um... I might drop hints about that yeah. okay. a bit later. But anyway, as far as Minnie the Minx is concerned, what do you think, Sister Bobby? Well, well it's a really sad tale. And I have to say I'm not guilty of this myself, so I can't really share in it. Uh, but it's a great lesson in life, isn't it? That's what I hope. I hope this, although difficult experience... Who, the, who, who do you think might have learned the lesson? Well, I don't think Dennis would have learned the lesson. No, I can tell like you he didn't. people like that never do. Yeah. <laughs> they, listen. Five years, I think. <laughs> yeah. yeah, really. <laughs> It's not long enough. Anyway, but he literally was playing the field, wasn't he? I mean, the thing is about your heart is when you're led by your heart, you're a complete idiot. So many of the minks, you know, we've all done it. The clue was, give me a quid. That was the clue. I know. know. It would have been a paper pound as well back then, wouldn't it? I mean, it's easy to forgive you, I think, in this case, because actually you fessed up to why you needed a pound for most of the journey. The thing is, if you'd have told the real truth, it might have been even more trouble. So you got him in enough trouble to stop him doing it. And it it. was kind of... It was sort of a truthful thing because although she did fancy Dennis, he was asking for money. So The other thing is, is she was controlled by her heart like all the other girls. Is They really liked him. He was just using them. So it's, you can forgive them for her trying to, you know, find a pound. He was a devilish rogue, Your You've Honor. forgiven many Well, minutes. yes. I mean, you know, it sounds like a pretty good scheme to me. I mean, he's not, a, he's not <laughs> demanding money with menaces, is he? He's, he's basically saying, do you want to be friends with Dennis? Because it's going to cast. And I think, uh, and, you know, everyone's entered into this uh, particular arrangement uh, with their eyes open. Uh, he, uh, even though they uh, obviously uh, yeah, some, some some of them gave money, uh, hoping that they were going to be the only one uh, to be the target of his affections. Uh, so I'm going to say uh, forgiven. Oh no, we're not forgetting. Uh, uh, I'm not <laughs> forgiving her because why? What's she well, why? frankly, because you know uh, he was. Uh, I thought he was a rather good scheme, and uh, I'm beginning to think the same. So I'm going to say. <laughs> Yes, I am not forgiving her. I think that's. I, I, but I am forgiving Dennis. Well done, Dennis. No one would have believed her anyway. I mean, she'd said, "I'm I'm taking this money so I can pay Dennis to be my boyfriend." No one would have believed that. So you know, definitely forgiven for You're that. You're so in trouble now. Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Father Simon, with trembling hand, I type my confession. I request forgiveness for the slight slip of my I'm a good person, really, persona. This confession goes back to the early 80s when I was at senior school and the typical schoolgirl coming from strict parents. You know the kind of thing. You will wear the school uniform, including the long white knee-length socks and brown lace-up shoes, regardless of the fact that no one else ever did. But there was one child who always stuck to every single detail of the school uniform, and that was me. So already standing out from the crowd, this uniform-abiding individual also had to endure being of a very slight build with spindly legs and long wavy hair. And basically, long wavy hair translates to rat's tails, which itself translates to many years of bullying from my classmates and peers, says Sam. Years of hell were endured, especially at the hands of one particular girl, who we'll call Jane to save her the despair of her shady past. She bullied me a lot. Jane's ultimate act of bullying came whilst I was sitting in a history class in front of her. But halfway through the lesson, the class started to snigger in unison. And at the time, I was blissfully unaware of why. But somewhere within my depths, I knew that it was at my expense. 
Once at home, it all became clear. Jane had cut a clump of my naturally wavy locks off. And not very well, I might add. My mother sadly tried to even out the damage, but I truly believe it made it worse, as did her offering to go and see the teacher, which thankfully I managed to talk her out of. Many years passed, and I often wondered what happened to the likes of Jane, and if she ever had children of her own, who themselves might have got bullied, giving her paws about her own awful actions. I should say that for my part, I'm now a woman without spindly legs, with the school uniform replaced by, hello, designer outfits and a good career. And as for the wavy locks, well, they're now tamed to perfection and cascade down my back in a shining triumph. Excellent. Do you like that? <laughs> yes, good okay, story. Very good. Well, that's not the whole I'm story. I'm sure it's not. <laughs> and then, as luck would have it, this is where it becomes a sitcom, I found out in the late noughties that Jane, the aforementioned Jane, actually became a hairdresser. And had her own salon, and it was in Essex. Surely her cutting skills must have improved since those early 80s days, I thought, and a plan was hatched. I decided to book an appointment. <laughs> this, this can only be fine. Oh, <laughs> with yeah. the newly found hairdresser for a trim and a blow-dry finish with all the special treatments and so on. But when the day came, I was shaking with fear, almost to the point of being sick. Could I do it? Could I really go through with it? And would she recognise me? But I managed to get myself together, and when I arrived, there was Jane to greet me, not a glimmer of recognition. I sat down and she began gaily trimming, not hacking my hair this time, and commenting on how beautiful my shining glory was, I just smiled politely back and said, thank you, thank you. With all the tools of her trade placed away, the big moment finally came at the till, when she produced the bill. With a steady eye, which, believe me, belied how I, the rest of me was feeling, I calmly stated, but Jane... You always cut my hair for free at school, so I've got no intention of paying you a cent right now. <laughs> it's fair to say Jane looked a little bewildered, followed by shock, and then slowly but surely came the flicker of recognition within her eye. Don't you remember, I say, I was on the receiving end of the first haircut you ever gave? It was then that the light bulb fully came on in her head, and all of a sudden Jane looked terribly embarrassed and flustered, and I have to confess, I felt absolutely fantastic. <laughs> As she started to stutter a reply, I simply turned on my beautiful kitten heel designer shoes and left the salon. So long! That's so long, not salon. It's... Yeah, obviously. Strangely enough, she never did call my mobile asking me to come back and pay her bill, and I didn't regret it at the time, but now I am here asking for forgiveness for my brief moment of assertiveness following five long years of hell at school. I am truly a good person. I work hard, pay my taxes, always treat everyone with respect, but surely I'm allowed one day off. And to be honest, I still smile to myself when I remember the look of complete horror on Jane's face. Well, you know, what are, you know, what are the chances that your school bully with the scissors ends up as a hairdresser? I mean, I think Jane should consider herself fortunate that you just claimed one haircut for free. Anyway, let's see what Sister Bobby makes of that. We had heads in hands and hands over eyes and all kinds of things here. That's heavy stuff, that is. Yeah. Because I feel it. I feel your pain. But, Sam, I'm not sure if it was the way to go. Or, I'll tell you what, I think in this case you did well. Uh, to come out of it okay. And her embarrassment actually is... Uh, I'm actually grateful she felt embarrassed in front of you because at least, obviously, she acknowledged that she was wrong when she was younger. Uh, but uh, children do do horrible, silly things sometimes. And I wouldn't recommend it as a kind of way to go for anyone else. I think in this case you're forgiven because I get it. I've met many a bully. And it is that your success is the is the best, you know, response to that. It, yeah, but I... you did play with fire there. It was a little dodgy because you never know what she could have done. So. I, th I think... I... I think Jane got off quite lightly. Anyway, Brother Matthew... What well, it's, say? it's certainly in, uh, it's a 20 years in the making, uh, this particular revenge, and, and, and some would say uh, unreasonable and petty, and therefore exactly my kind of revenge. There's no revenge better than the one that seems completely out of proportion to what had happened before. So I am uh, fully, fully square behind you on this, Sam. Uh, if only I'd been in the salon as well, but then I'm not going to spend that much on a haircut. So I am definitely going to forgive. I don't, I don't have you down as a hair salon kind of not, guy. Not really my kind of thing. But, uh, you know, for fair play to people who love the hair salons, I'm sure they're all fabulous. I know for, a, for, you know, for the first couple of minutes you were thinking, is this our tune or something? I mean, <laughs> what, what is this? What is this? Has it got on the wrong part? 
Father Simon and the Venerable Collective. This is a confession that's been waiting to be typed for many years and very recent events, which I'll come to later, have now made this tale more timely than it has ever been. It dates back to the early 80s when I was a young, fresh-faced 13-year-old boy. By and large, I was a good lad and I embraced school and all it had to offer. I also enjoyed many extracurricular activities, but it was hockey where I had the most success. This was largely due to my PE teacher, a guy called Mr. Crook, Mr. Cook, beg your pardon. Mr. Cook was a quality hockey coach who could still play a bit and in his day had played against the very best in the country. Thanks to Mr. Cook's relentless and unwavering energy and commitment, in our year alone, six of us were sent for county trials, two of whom were successful. We loved him. Of course, success is something that doesn't just happen. We used to train two mornings a week before school even started, Tuesday and Thursday mornings at the stupid hour of half past seven in the morning. However, we would always be rewarded with an indoor game towards the end of the hour where we would get the opportunity to implement our newly honed skills. He's a hardcore hockey man. Now, as, our, as well as our hockey uh, activities, my other love was pets. Don't look like that. <laughs> My, I didn't. You did. Didn't. You had that. Oh, oh no. Here we go. Look. Okay. My rabbits, my guinea pigs, our cat and our dogs. And it made sense, therefore, that it was down to me to pick up most of the pet-related chores in our house, including cleaning up after the dogs in the back garden. And this was always performed before school. There are other tasks that were distributed amongst the other members of the family, but this was my job. Back then, I had two tried and tested methods of cleaning up after the dogs of a morning. The first most boring, most responsible and most used method was to simply use an old plastic spade to collect and then deposit in a bag. This would then eventually find its way into the household waste and be removed by the lucky bin men. This was a long time before poo bins, as you may well uh, remember. Yes. Yes, we didn't do that kind of thing back in the good old days. The second, however, brought together my two great loves, hockey and animals. I know you're way, way ahead of me on this. <laughs> you see, in hockey, there was what's known as an aerial ball. This was a similar technique as used when taking a penalty flick um. and essentially meant that you would lean right back with your stick placed under the leading edge of the ball where you would proceed to launch it over the opposition's heads. <laughs> the hope being that one of your team would have anticipated this cunning and technically demanding manoeuvre. So, on a cold winter's morning... When mainly white dog poo littered our rear... Why was that? Anyway, our rear lawn, which at different times, it seemed an entirely appropriate thing to practice my aerial ball technique by launching frozen dog poo up and down and out of the garden <laughs> of and over into the farmer's field behind our house using the old hockey stick. It was a win-win situation, I thought. I got some more hockey practice in uh -huh. and the garden got cleared at the same time. Win-win. This was all until one particularly cold morning when I can only assume that our Labrador on the previous day had eaten their body weight in mince morsels. <laughs> <laughs> There's mince morsels. Yes. We used to have those every day. Well, we used to have them. We used to feed them the dog. <laughs> and pedigree chum and dog biscuits, judging by what was presented to me that fine winter's morning. On this morning, I can only describe my technique as poor as I proceeded to hook said frozen dog poo over the fence, but this time straight through the next-door neighbour's greenhouse oh. roof. Oh. Well, you know, it's kind of fertiliser. But you smashed a pain. Oh, yeah. I'm, thank you, Your Honour. I made a hasty retreat, and to this day, more than 30 years later, I've never shared this story with anybody at all. My mother, my poor next-door neighbour, they do not know about this. Next-door neighbour never mentioned it, so I can only imagine that he assumed it had come from a bird. I'm sure the neighbour for years must have been left wondering the sheer scale of this bird that must have flown over. <laughs> such a load. We didn't have many albatrosses. <laughs> a condor, maybe. <laughs> Pesky condor! It was hearing Jeremy Vine's item on poo flick sticks <laughs> that made me realise it was finally time to confess. In fact, the poo... Is it still in the studio? No, but the stick is. There you go. There's, there you the, go. there's the stick. That they are. That they're the sticks which Jeremy was using. I think he was improvising with chili con carne and a chocolate eclair and I a think. bread roll. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Okay. Anyway, it's because of Jeremy Vine, basically. Anyway, I throw myself onto the astroturfed altar to seek your forgiveness. 
not from the farmer for littering his prime grazing land with dog waste and for all the biohazards that may have presented his prize Frisians, nor indeed from the next-door neighbour who, quite frankly, was always looking for manure for his garden from wherever he could get it. No, I seek forgiveness from our PE teacher, Mr Cook, for such a dedicated and committed hockey coach for such an appalling display of technique that morning. Mr Cook put so much time into all of this, he deserved a lot better. Well, I know, you know, as soon as you mentioned, you know, clearing up and uh, hockey, that you probably worked out where this was going. But, you know, 30 years on and the neighbour still doesn't know whether it was a condor, an albatross or the annoying 13-year-old next door, says the Bobby with a stern face. Well, the thing is, is you did smash a pane next door, which you should have confessed up for, to be quite honest. And also, there was no way that the neighbour next door thought that was a bird. It's completely different consistency and looks. It's is just it? different. Yes. How do you know? It's not just because you've you you must have had a pigeon. Yeah, well, it's not a pigeon. On your shoulder at some point. Talking about a condor. <laughs> yes, I know, but it's still different. On the your makeup shoulder. is different. <laughs> Having said that, Long John Silver. you are forgiven also for your lack of skill. Uh, I have to say, it made me laugh. But the thing is, you could only do it on frozen days, and. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I reckon he did it on other days. He's just telling us about the frozen days. Yeah, <laughs> what do you think? Um, I loved it. I Tumble. absolutely loved it. But I mostly loved it and forgiving you for the uh, for mentioning mince morsels, which I've forgotten. Mince morsels. <laughs> Words, you know, yeah. in, in packets. Yes. Pour it in. Yeah. None of that annoying dog gravy anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Those are the days. You never had a dog back then in the no. 70s, did you? No. 70s dogs loved it. <laughs> uh, what do you say, Brother yes. Matthew? Um, well, I mean, obviously forgiven. Um, but, I mean, the, the, the neighbour's not going to know the difference, whether it was a bird with with particularly uh, a heavy load or or whether it was going to be some some other reason that they pay. You're not going to dust for dog poo. There's no CSI in those. It's back at different times. It was. Um, so, and, and also, there's nothing to f- f- forgive as far as the hockey coach is concerned. You're all Always looking, on, or you, you should always be looking for applications outside of your sport for the skills and talents that you've learned within it. So, so uh, it's win-win all round. Everyone wins, apart from obviously the man with the uh, okay. poo in his uh, in his greenhouse. But yes. apart from that, everyone has won. Was condor a type of pipe tobacco? It was, yes, condor. Ah, con- yes. <laughs> don't try that either. No, don't do that. Obviously. <laughs> Dear Father Simon, and the, I'm just checking, is there a No, I think we're all okay. I think we're all okay on this. Father Simon, the collective, uh, though my life has been far from sin free, for the first time I am now prompted to write a confession. And all because your tale of the rubber iguana from afar <laughs> reminded me of a youthful deviation from the right path. This confession dates back to 1972, when for some peculiar climactic coincidence, a settled weather period must have created perfect weather conditions for crickets. Mm. Our school playing field was thick with them. So much so (laughs) that the girls had stopped making daisy chains and confined their leisure time to the yard. Because if you walked outside sounding like this... Mm. A lot of crickets. That's an awful lot. That's a whole jungle full, that is. To set the scene in the days before equality, a national curriculum, and any common sense in the education department, it was thought a good idea that all the final year boys would once a week swap with the girls in Mr Kelson's class and do craft in the winter or cycling proficiency in the summer, while the girls from both classes did needlework in our oh. classroom. That's mm. the way, that's the way... It was. Different times, Different everyone. times. I know. What? I just remember those days. Did you do needlework? No. Did you, Nigel? Uh, I enough, co- no, but quite big on cycling proficiency. I would quite like to have done some needlework, yeah. as I think we all... We yeah, all I did needlework, no, so there you yeah. go. Yeah, there you did go. you? Yeah. yeah, I did, yeah. Excellent, there you yeah. go. You see, we've moved on. This yeah. is progress, that's yeah. what this is. Uh, do your family know you yeah, do needlework? Yeah, they're all very happy with me doing money. And your mates. Yeah. Yeah. So on this particular Thursday lunchtime, all 15 of the boys in my class spent our precious lunchtime filling every possible receptacle we could get our hands on. Mm. with crickets. Oh, it's fun. Now, unless you've tried, and I suspect you haven't, you cannot imagine how many of these innocent creatures you can actually fit into an empty crisp packet. Nor could you imagine how many such packets a determined 11-year-old could collect within an 80-minute lunch break. 80 minutes. And not just crisp packets. Those triangular waxy cardboard Jubilee drinks cartons, them, sandwich boxes, socks and anything else that could contain a cricket now contained at least one cricket. 
The bell went for the end of lunch, so we went out. We went back to our room, sat quietly whilst the register was taken, then filed out, casually leaving behind our now open packages, poorly concealed behind various schools, bags and coats. Like any 11-year-old boy, we gave thought, no thought at all to the consequences of our actions other than it might be quite funny. <laughs> it turns out... It was! We weren't wrong. Mm. <laughs> uh, it, uh, yes, uh, nor did we have to wait very long. First came the screams, a shrill, piercing wail that would have stirred a corpse, followed by another and another till it became a cacophony, Father Simon. Next came the exodus, 32 11-year-old girls on the run, desks and chairs overturned, park completed, tapestries trodden underfoot. A normally competent teacher, absolutely speechless, powerless and devoid of any influence whatsoever because of the blind panic which was caused by hundreds and hundreds of storming crickets. Leaping, dancing, shrieking, ripping off of cardigans and jumpers, running fingers through hair and running out of the building, Mr Kelson, to his credit, appeared to find it as amusing as the rest of us boys as he almost stopped scowling for at least a whole second. And then there was the strangely eerie classroom with no pupils and furniture asunder. The floor, though, had taken on a strange greyish hue and it appeared to be alive and jumping. All this to the steady background hum of a thousand chirping crickets in an alien environment. To call our collective endeavours an infestation does us no justice. This was a biblical plague, that's what this was. And it brings us neatly to the question of redemption. You see, in all these years, I've never felt even the remotest stirrings of regret. I've dined out on the story many times, even enjoying free drinks and compliments from fellow revellers. And this is the rub because whilst, along with my co-conspirators Colin and Stumpy, I was certainly a ringleader, coercing and encouraging others, collecting containers and coordinating the release. I must now confess it wasn't my idea. I got it from Colin, and I'm sure he got it from Stumpy. So for failing to give credit where credit is due, for passing off another's work as my own, and other infringements of intellectual property rights, and I seek forgiveness. This is Patrick uh, with his story of a thousand crickets, which had been assembled with the sole purpose of annoying the girls. That's what it was there for. And that's what it did. Sister Bobby is on the warpath. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's really easy, Patrick. The absolute answer to your forgiveness is no, 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 because the, uh, because the crickets had no choice. So you took their crickets from their lovely place and you put them somewhere in an environment which might have meant their messy end. They had no choice. You're a rotten monkey, Patrick. <laughs> And you had no regret. I can't believe it. You don't even feel bad now as a grown-up. No. That's the worrying thing. Uh, what, what do you make of this, novice? Well, I hope they were gathered up and eaten, uh, because they are. They're, they're very good. They're, they're very tasty and yes. uh, very good with oils and things like that. So I, I hope there was... I'm they, not sure that's the answer Bobby was looking for. Or, the, or they were released, at least. Or maybe they were released, then, Bobby. That's, that would be not... Let's, you know, they were let, not just scooped up and put into a bin. I hope they were let go. What was amazing, me, Patrick, the Jolly Jake was great, and I thought all that... It was only right at the end when he said the only people he was seeking forgiveness from was Colin and Stumpy, because he'd stolen their ideas, because yes. he wasn't original. Like, it's not from the girls at all. And therefore, Patrick, remarkably, on this occasion, no, I'm not going to forgive you. Oh. I thought it was the girls you were going to ask for. Brother Matthew. For. Well, I, I mean, <laughs> normally I'd be full square behind him with the idea of annoying all the girls. I mean, they're only crickets. I mean, come on. Um, you know, making the floor alive. They have Deal rights, with it. you know. Deal with it, you know. Um, but, 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 I mean, I may have the morals of a sewer rat, but I, I, I would say if you're going to write in with a confession, you have to show some remorse. There's got to be something there that says, maybe I shouldn't have done this. And clearly, Patrick is showing no remorse. He's just dining out on his story about his cricket. So for that reason, not forgiven. Well, they were this week's confessions. Uh, if it has sparked a shadowy thought, can you spark a shadowy thought? Or most certainly not. Anyway, if it has made your soul troubled and you'd like to tell us a confession, it's confessions at bbc.co.uk. We have our own email for it. Uh, thank you, you can send that in. And if you missed any of the Drive Time shows, you can listen back online or you can download to your smartphone or tablet from the BBC iPlayer radio app. Monday, uh, sports journalist Matthew Syed was in talking about his search for sporting perfection and we found out about the man who changed his name to Jellyfish McSavoloy, as you would. 
Tuesday was another Tuesday with Al Stewart and Dire Straits, The Damned and Elton John. There's a good festival lineup. Wednesday, we were talking about head lice, much to everyone's delight and physical irritation. Plus, historian Lucy Worsley was in to talk about her new book about the young Queen Victoria. Foodie Thursday, Nigel was doing a Turkish schnitzel. Check out the recipe on the BBC Radio 2 website. And if you made it to the end of last week's podcast, you had to tweet, do you fancy an impromptu student fitness session? This was a reference to a confession rather than anything else. Thanks to Julie and Nikki and Craig and Billy and many more who looked pretty foolish whilst tweeting that particular message. This week's far more straightforward. Uh, If you get to this part of the podcast, you're still there and prepared to prove it. All you have to do is to tweet this week's special code secret phrase, which is jellyfish McSavaloy or I've got nits. (laughs) 